Uh, what we're going to start with today is a proposal from Dr. Wayne Mack from the Law Commission uh, about the importance of having, uh, and the difficulties perhaps, of having human rights standards put into a constitutional framework. Uh, but he's going to be talking to his paper, which uh, I hope everybody has got a copy of, and also his draft of a constitution bill, uh, which um, is a potentially exciting development. So, Wayne, I'll, the floor is for you. Thank you very much, Chris, and I will not speak for too long because I'm conscious that the value of these events is in fact very much the discussion. In many respects, um, what I'm going to talk about is a continuation of what was discussed last night, and although the um, agenda set out, particularly the situation of Sid and uh, John as being sort of polar opposites, in truth, uh, the presentations by all three of them were actually... They had, there was a large degree of commonality in, in it. And um, the, the, the thing that uh, Sid really finished his discussion on was a new Constitution Act, um, but he wasn't necessarily proposing it as supreme law, uh, as in, let's say, the Canadian uh, Bill of Rights Act, for instance. And that certainly wasn't excluded, I guess you'd say, um, and by the subsequent two speakers and uh, but they did say that <coughs> excuse me that radical change uh, of a constitution a major shake up of constitutional situations really only occurs when a country has gone through a revolutionary uh, period either a civil war or the creation of a country or something of that nature but, it, but my proposition is a little bit different to that because I would argue, as my paper indicates, is that in fact over the last 30, perhaps even 40 years, New Zealand has been going through a continual evolution of our constitutional arrangements. And in many respects, the, uh, the Constitutional Advisory Panel is a continuation of that process, um, intended to perhaps be more of a public dialogue than prior events. I think there's a lot of uh, truth in what was said by John and Paul uh, that in fact um, quite a lot of initiatives of a constitutional nature really arise in Parliament and perhaps do not always have full debate uh, except in so far as that there is a select committee process or something of that nature. Now, I, I certainly have seen the establishment of the Constitutional Advisory Panel as really as an opportunity to do something uh, that I'd worked on really now a decade ago but could never get the agreement of my former colleagues when, uh, when the National Party was in opposition, which was essentially to have a member's bill, as it would have been then, to um, make... Uh, to essentially have a more comprehensive constitutional act, constitution act in the model of the 1986 Act. So large numbers of New Zealanders, of course, are not even aware that we have a 1986 Constitution Act, and they certainly wouldn't be aware what's actually in it, uh, which does contain some quite profound and important principles, but also some relatively minor things as well, and in particular it's not comprehensive. I would suggest to you, in contrast, large numbers of New Zealanders do, however, know about our Bill of Rights Act, the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990. Um, they may not necessarily know all the content of it, but they would be aware of its existence and would cite it if they were, in, say, in difficulty with the police. They might raise it as you know, a particular right is being breached or abused or something like that. Uh, so, so you do see that some constitutional issues and provisions in New Zealand have progressively become more uh, understandable and more widely known. I won't go through in the paper the establishment of the Constitutional Advisory Panel. That was well covered uh, last night um, by all three speakers, in fact, but obviously uh, particularly by Professor Winniart Walker, who of course is a member of the, the panel um, and uh, there, but I do, what would like to draw out one particular point is part and parcel of the process, there have been a whole series of forums 
and conventions that have been organised. One of those was by the uh, McInnes Institute and uh, that was a young person's forum and the particular role of that forum was to actually draft a constitution. There's a website, you can go and read it. Um, and it was a, it's a very interesting document. It um, probably goes further than would actually be able to be implemented. But many of the ideas in it uh, are what you would reasonably expect to see in a constitutional, whether that be um, superior law or whether it be an ordinary act of parliament. And I certainly get a sense there's a bit of a discussion around at the moment as to whether we can, in essence, improve on the 1986 Act. I do note in the paper the ranges of changes that have occurred, again well canvassed last night, um, and, uh, and, but just to mention some of them, the Treaty of Waitangi Act, the Constitution Act itself of course, the Bill of Rights Act, Human Rights Act uh, which was uh, re-enacted in 1993, of course the Electoral Act, Supreme Court Act of course which Professor Wilson was very much the author of here today. Uh, and not forgetting, in many respects, one of the most significant, Section 9 of the State-Owned Enterprises Act. And you'll note in that respect, <coughs> particular respect, um, Parliament has never really sought to change the wording of that particular section. So that when it got um, re-enacted in the legislation in relation to the mixed ownership model, it was really adopted more or less as it was in uh, the 1986 Act and the reason for that in part is because there's now been a, a fair amount of um, judicial interpretation through, uh, particularly through New Zealand's leading constitutional case, the New Zealand Māori Council case from 1987 and I don't think Parliament, taken as a whole that is, would really wish to disturb to any marked extent uh, those judicial findings um, because then they would be going to what they might perceive as uncharted territory yet again. Um, I do set out in the paper why I think there are reason, the reasons why I think we are, if I could put this way, somewhat dissatisfied with our existing constitutional arrangements. That we're not, we know that it's somewhat anomalous to have what in truth is actually a complete constitution. It's not as if we don't have a complete constitution, but it's just that you can't find it in any particular document. You have to uh, look at a wide range of legislation, you have to have an understanding of conventions, you would need to read some of the leading decisions. Well, people in other countries don't have to actually do all of that to know at least the core elements of the constitution. We, in fact, have to, and because of that it makes it somewhat uh, inaccessible to the general public. Of course it provides uh, a lot of enjoyment for lawyers and law students and universities because it becomes very much their domain. I think the other reason, uh, well in fact I set out three reasons. I also suggest that one of the reasons why we keep talking about this issue is the fact that we're a constitutional monarchy. And we know in our hearts whether or not uh, people are monarchists, for want of a better term, or republicans. They know that there's, there's something that's not kind of normal about it, if I could put it that way. That it seems rather unusual that we would have our head of, st measured by international terms that is, not our own history, rather unusual that we would have our head of state uh, located in a country 12,000 miles away, and the question continuously arises, so how long is this actually going to be the case? And virtually every Prime Minister in the last 30 years has basically raised this question. The one who in fact raised it has, was the most consistent in doing so, and the, per, the one Prime Minister who was really most overtly Republican was Prime Minister Bolger. And I did note during the time of that debate that he kept because he kept raising it uh, on a regular basis, that actually his advocacy, for want of a better term, actually did shift public opinion somewhat, not a lot, from about 25% in support of a republic to, my recollection is a high of 35, and I rechecked that recently. Since then, it's essentially fallen back to 25%. And I think actually, um, 
well certainly for people of my generation, I imagine also Margaret's, um, well same generation really actually, um, that's actually a surprise to me. If you'd asked me in 1990 or perhaps even 1980, will New Zealand have the same attachment to being a constitutional monarchy 35 years from now, I would have said, oh, that's just completely ridiculous. There'll be a, you know, a whole new generation will have a different view. But actually, that doesn't seem to have been the case. And to be honest, I'm not entirely why that is the case, but that is the case. But never, so therefore, people have operated uh, who want change, and that's included successive governments, operated within that paradigm. And so things around symbolism tend to be uh, chosen, and, oh, and also more substantive things. But just to take the issues of symbolism, so we changed uh, the imperial honours system uh, back in 1997, that was done primarily by Prime Minister Bolger, to the current system of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Now, of course, it's still a rural honours system, uh, so because we are a constitutional monarchy. Prime Minister Clark's government uh, continued that by removing uh, knighthoods, which were, of course, as we all know, restored uh, in 2009. And I actually would raise the question now whether an incoming um, Labour government would see this as quite the priority that Prime Minister Clark to do to rechange it. In contrast, in Australia, what happened is that the, um, the it was removed in '72 by the Whitlam government, uh, reinstated by the Fraser government in '75, '76. Um, then taken away in uh, 1983 by the Hawke government and of course never reinstated. It's not the sort of thing you can keep flipping backwards and forthwards on indefinitely. So if it occurs again I suspect that would be uh, the last time. But I also wonder if we are quite in the same mood as Australia on this issue as well. Um, I do note uh, that the Governor General has been, I think, it can be fairly said to be increasingly viewed by New Zealanders uh, and governments as essentially an Indigenous head of state. And indeed, I would also make the observation if, if, the, if the Governor General was actually the head of state, the, the financial cost would not change at all. We do vest uh, that office with actually quite a lot of formality and symbolism. And, um, and all of the uh, that goes with that, uh, that it would hardly need changing. And I do also say that it's not been really dependent on them being New Zealanders so much as them conspicuously acting as our national representative rather than the representative of the, of the monarchy. If you just have to see the way contemporary governors general speak, they speak as representing us, in fact. Not in an elective sense, but as a symbol. I also note uh, more substantial changes, and in particular the uh, establishment of the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a hot debate uh, in the opposition at the time as to whether we would support it or not. Uh, kind of quite bizarrely, uh, in some respects actually, in retrospect, the initial bill had actually been introduced um, by the Bolger government, which was actually very inadequate. It simply lopped off the top um, and didn't have two tiers of appeal. Uh, the Clark government, and in particular, I will play uh, uh, acknowledgement here to uh, Professor Wilson, uh, very much your initiative, m had a much better system of essentially two tiers of appeal. And it was pretty obvious, uh, certainly to me, and at one stage I had a role in justice issues, uh, that once established there was no going back. And um, I had to convince some of my colleagues of the necessity for a change of position on that. And, and now, of course, it's uh, broadly accepted. I also think it was very important that they have the home that they do. I think symbols of nationhood, uh, parliaments, courts, uh, vice-regal uh, residences and the like, actually are uh, expressions of nation nationhood. And, um, and if you devalue them by not giving them that sense of um, prominence in your constitutional system in a kind of visible, physical way, 
then it becomes harder to understand the role and importance they perform in society. Uh, I then refer to the, the second reason being uh, the discussion around the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, I make the observation there that I think it now would be difficult to imagine a contemporary New Zealand Parliament deliberately passing legislation that was seen as in direct contravention of the Treaty of Waitangi. And I think the passage of the Foreshore and Seabed Act in 2004 was a bit of a, a litmus test of that. I think uh, a, f a future government would seek to avoid that kind of situation arising again. Uh, you know, lessons are learnt through these things, often by experience. And um, as I said, I finally conclude that the, uh, the third reason we are dissatisfied is that our constitution is simply too scattered, too hard to find uh, in, a, in one place. And uh, as I say, it's not, not so much the issue of superior law, but rather that it's just, as I say, just simply too hard to, to ascertain all the elements of it. So, so as a consequence, I suggest, and I've made a submission uh, to the Constitutional Advisory Panel, that we need a more comprehensive Constitution Act to replace the 1986 Act. Uh, not to change its status as an ordinary act of Parliament, but to be more comprehensive. Now, the 1986 Act, as I say, has got some very important constitutional uh, issue principles within it. The role of Parliament, the term of Parliament, election of members to it, the fact that judges can't be um, readily removed and so forth. Interestingly enough, nothing in it about the role of the judiciary and by that is the senior judiciary that is. Um, nothing about the functions and role of cabinet, though there is a discussion about the functions and role of the executive, not entirely quite the same thing. Um, the executive council, there's obviously a coalescence, but it's not quite the same. And I think it would be possible to have a more complete act, also written in a way that was uh, a slightly more accessible than the current act. It was noted at the time, the 86 Act, that it would provide the opportunity for an indigenous constitution to grow, and I think we have arrived at that point in time. And I think the advisory panel uh, has an opportunity, almost a unique opportunity, to essentially propose this. I do say, and this is an important uh, point to, to, that I wish to emphasise, that in doing so, this is not proposing a constitutional revolution. That the only existing alternative to the existing statute is the creation of a written constitution as fundamental law. And I say that New Zealand constitutional change is more incremental than that. Uh, but that's not to say we don't have lots of it, because we certainly have had over the last 30 years, and this proposal is really a continuation of that process. I also noted, and I think this is one of the changes, almost a <coughs> cultural change that has occurred in a society. There would be a generation of New Zealanders who would say, specifically lawyers here I'm talking about, who would say that constitutions should actually be supreme law. And that generation would be largely reflected by people like myself, or perhaps a generation uh, above myself, the late Professor Brookfield and others like him. That is no longer really argued. And I note that at a symposium that was held here last year, uh, two of the contributors directly argued against that and uh, emphasised the role of parliamentary sovereignty, that the will of the people um, ought to be paramount rather than, uh, and, and always ought to be able to make law. And I noted in the, um, the, the draft uh, prepared by the McGuinness Symposium, they actually had in their final clause in their proposed constitution, nothing in the constitution gives the judiciary the power to declare any enactment to be invalid. And um, I spoke to some members uh, of, the, of their, uh, this, that particular 
symposium why they'd taken that view. And they said, well, that's because Parliament, as the will of the people, really is the, is the fundamental lawmaker of our nation. That we don't transfer that responsibility uh, out of to a, another group of people that we don't have uh, direct electoral control over. Now, that's not to say they want their parliament to just act in an untrammeled manner. Obviously, they don't. Um, and I think the points that were made uh, last night about by uh, were referring to, in fact, Justice Learned Hand, that in that sense, that the the the, the sense of um, a limited government, if you will, uh, sort of pretty well embedded in our national DNA, for want of a, a better term. But there is that sense that uh, the parliament, as the expression of the people's will, should be our supreme lawmaker. Now, I've uh, got here, of course, uh, what I have as a proposed uh, bill. You'll see that um, I. It covers a range of issues in it. One of the first starting points to note in it is I actually have a preamble. Uh, preambles are common in some legislation in New Zealand, notably treaty settlements. And they record the history of the settlement, not actually the history of the settlement, the history of the grievance and of the people that has led to the settlement. Um, and I've uh, referred to preambles of, from many constitutions, uh, including the, um, the one that did not succeed in Australia, uh, which was put to, um, to a referendum in 1999. And so I have this preamble which you can read there. Um, I specifically note uh, the role of the treaty in the preamble and also you know, a, a series of what I would think uh, national values that New Zealanders really would uh, not, that all New Zealanders would say, this is essentially us. Um, within the, uh, the body of the document itself, the most, that there are two vexing issues really. I mean, to sort of set out the role of Parliament and the role of the executive and the judiciary is in a sense not that difficult um, because it's uh, a well canvassed territory. The, the the difficult area is, arises in two areas. One, what do you do about the treaty? Two, what do you do about the New Zealand Bill of Rights? Or the, I should more accurately say the Bill of Rights in this context. And when I drafted this bill back in 2004, I left reference to the treaty only in the preamble. Did not actually have it in, in the operative clauses. I think uh, the national mood has moved on in the previous decade and I uh, instance the Foreshore and Seabed Act as in a sense reflecting a little bit of that cultural change. It was a bit of a watershed for our nation, um, that one, and it changed the mood of Parliament uh, in relation to attitudes to the treaty. The debate around the mixed ownership model also did the same thing and you saw the government um, put, include a provision in almost identical terms to section nine, uh, that the parliament should, could, or the government could not act inconsistent with the principles of the treaty. And I think that actually indicated really to us as New Zealanders that parliament really across the collectivity of it now does not think it would be legitimate to act uh, in a manner that was inconsistent with the treaty. And so because of that, I've taken the view that you should actually enact essentially the same term uh, in a proposed Constitution Act as well. I haven't included the treaty itself as an annex or anything of that nature in it, and I suspect without actually knowing, uh, I'm aware of some of the debate, that that probably wouldn't necessarily be welcomed by Maori people. They might see that as actually a little bit risky. Um, and they would want the treaty to be have a more elevated status than being in an ordinary act of parliament. It is an ordinary act of parliament already, of course, the Treaty of Waitangi Act, but for a very specific purpose in that instance. The second issue that um, has also been vexing to me uh, has been, do you include the Bill of Rights Act or the principles of the Bill of Rights uh, in the 
the Constitution or not. My initial draft back in 2004 did. So that was my view then. Um, this one does not. What it kind of actually argues that it's a finely balanced argument, <laughs> even for myself. So why did I include it then, but not now? So I included it then because I thought, well, a constitution should actually, even if it's an ordinary act of parliament, should actually include the values that we hold as really central to the operation of a modern democracy that values individual liberty and freedom. Uh, and so I included them. Then I had discussions with quite a lot of people subsequently. I said, well, in truth, the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, and it's now 23 years since enactment, has established its own mana, if you will. And although it's still an ordinary act of parliament, in truth, really, it's an elevated act of parliament. Um, and we can see a few sceptically raised eyebrows, but I actually think it is seen as an elevated act of parliament. It's, um, it's ch achieved that status. There's relatively few acts of parliament that are in that category. Uh, Section 9 has become in that category specifically. The Bill of Rights Act has. The Constitution Act, interestingly enough, has not, in my view. It's just not well known enough. Um, the Human Rights Act, I think you could say the same. The Ombudsman's Act. You can name some acts that people see as cardinal acts, and at least at the fundamental principle level, Parliament is loath to really interfere with the, um, the, the fundamental protections brought in it. There's also a lot of uh, case law now that's derived directly from the Bill of Rights Act. So I've sort of taken the view now that uh, what we would end up with in this scenario uh, the desired outcome, I would say, is a Constitution Act that is comprehensive and, at least in symbolic terms, has an elevated status, and a New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990 that already actually has that status. You don't have to do that again, it's already achieved that status. And they would be seen as the two prime acts, if you will, that speak to us about, uh, firstly, the arrangements of government, and secondly, the rights and uh, privileges of citizenship uh, and uh, the participation in our democracy, if you think of the Bill of Rights Act being essentially civil and political rights and not more. Um, I would have to say, I personally don't think uh, we should go beyond that. For instance, I'm not a supporter of uh, Seed's view that we would have a sort of a third elevated statute, if you will, that would uncover the economic, social and employment rights. And the reason for that is that to a greater or lesser extent you can describe civil rights as absolutes. Now I know they're not literally absolutes, but for instance you either are arrested or you're not arrested. You either are in custody or you're not in custody. Um, Obviously, in terms of freedom of speech, it's a much more relative concept. But quite a lot of your civil rights have a quality of absoluteness about them. That is much less true of a cultural, social and economic rights. There's a relativity about them that is the subject of you know, deep political debate um, on a, essentially party political terms. And in any event, governments are challenged to actually um, fully protect them anyway. If you, uh, in Europe, of course, they tend to have a more substantial status. And so there is a right to employment. But that hasn't helped the people of Greece or Spain um, to any marked extent. Um, you know, there are other fundamental factors that drive those things rather than the inclusion in statute. Um, uh, and, and obviously the New Zealand Parliament, <coughs> uh, or rather more accurately, not the New Zealand Parliament, the the, the, the government and people of New Zealand see the rights to education, health, um, relief from poverty as really central to what we do as a government. 70% of all national expenditure goes in those areas. So we clearly as a society think they are important. Um, but we have debates quite clearly as to where the boundaries lies, 
how much the support should be in this direction or that direction, you know, what support that private schools should have relative to public schools, where the charter schools have a place, and so on and so forth. And I'm not, I'm not even making a judgment on any one of those things, I'm just noting the fact these are things of active political debate. And you would expect that to be so, and it would be unlikely that any of those things will ever be finally resolved, that there will always be a debate on those things and the public will choose um, political parties on the relative merits of them in relation to the circumstances uh, that they find. But um, in conclusion, because I'm conscious that there should be appropriate time for questions and discussion, discussion perhaps more than questions, um, I do think the time has come to have a more comprehensive Constitution Act uh, that is uh, more accessible to people uh, and that I believe that the Parliament really irrespective of who happens to be the government of the day, would see this as a credible and viable project for enactment. Thank you.